Given the number of competing voices with contradictory claims about what the Bible means or even says, it's easy to lose track of the fact that it actually does mean stuff, right? Like when the original authors wrote it, they were actually trying to convey very specific things, but those things are often obscured by theology, archaic language, mistranslations, scribes with ulterior motives, and deliberate misinformation, to name a few, so much so that it's hard for a layperson to refute any specific claim about the book's meaning, which is why I was so excited to learn that longtime friend of the show, Dan Beecher, was teaming up with TikTok's favorite biblical scholar, Dan McClellan, for a new podcast called Data Over Dogma to tackle this very problem. And they were kind enough to join us tonight to talk about it. Dan, Dan, welcome back to Slash 2, the show. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and the invitation. Yeah, you bet. So, okay, so first things first, obviously, you guys are both named Dan. Yeah. I can't do Dan 1 and Dan 2. I can't rank <laughs> you guys. So, how are we, we going to do this? Who's taller? Is there a big Dan, little Dan, or what are we going to do? Well, I go by uh, uh, McClellan, a phonetic spelling of my last name. And ever since high school, people have called me Mac. So if you want to call me Mac, that would be fine. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Awesome. Then, and that's good because I don't think I can call Dan anything else at this point. I've known him for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> you could call me Uncle Dan. Some people. Oh, there you go. There you go. That, Uncle know. Dan and Mac. I like it. This is getting real personable all of a sudden. <laughs> so Mac, you, you rose to prominence on TikTok. I feel like I'm obligated to ask. <laughs> Are you now or have you ever been a Chinese spy? You have to tell me if I ask. <laughs> My understanding is that those are not the rules. Oh, damn it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Who told you that? <laughs> no, I have been shocked at how much uh, anger and uh, how much misinformation there is out there about TikTok. I thought it was just for teenagers dancing, but then once Korean youth started interrupting and messing with the GOP presidential campaigns, I was like, there may be some value to what is going on over here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And so I thought, you know what, I might, I might give this a try. I was seeing people post stuff that was kind of overlapped with my areas of expertise. And, and it seemed like there was not a whole lot of great information on TikTok and a lot of misinformation. So I, so I thought I'd, I would dip my toe. And I don't know uh, that I have been furtively made to sign away any of my citizenship or rights or anything like that. But uh, All right. well, <laughs> some people certainly make it sound like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's banned. In some, so in the states where it, uh, TikTok isn't banned, you can check Mac out. We'll have some links in the show notes. So Uncle Dan, tell me, how did you guys hook up? How did this happen? Well, I, you know, it's funny. I went on TikTok because some very young friends told me that I should, and I was very skeptical of it. But instantly... Unlike the experience of several of like Republican legislators and whatnot, I didn't find only young girls dancing and skim, you know, <laughs> skimpily dressed dancing. I actually found a lot of really substantive, awesome content. And one of the things that popped up on my on my feed a bunch was this guy who I was pretty sure was an atheist, but he was doing this really cool biblical scholarship stuff. But I couldn't tell like where his stance was, where his per and when I found out that he was a Mormon living in the same city that I was living in, I was fascinated. And so I literally reached out to him. This was before he had half a million followers. And I was like, um, we have to get to know each other because this you're too interesting for me not to know, you know, being in, in the same city as me. And foolishly, he agreed to go to lunch with me. <laughs> and, you know, we've been friends ever since. That was that was a couple of years ago, a year and a half. I don't know. I've, I've got no sense of time. But, you know, we stayed friends and I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop, for him to post something that I wouldn't like or for me to post something that he wouldn't like. And, and then, you know, then we could both write each other off because we come from such different camps. He being a believer and me being a, you know, filthy atheist. And it ended up never happening. We both, you know, it, this has become a paragon of interbelief meeting of the minds. Yeah, well, I, I will say I was super excited when I learned that there was going to be a long form version of of some of the stuff that, I, that I'd seen on TikTok. But for those people who aren't familiar with Mac's existing work, so I know, and Mac, I'll let you take this one. Give me the elevator pitch. What is, what is data over dogma all about? 
Well, when I started getting on on TikTok, primarily it was about confronting misinformation and data over dogma became kind of a, a bit of a motto for my for my channel because I was there to try to cut through a lot of the dogmatism and the identity politics and the retreating to to these battle lines that get drawn up in public discourse. And I position myself to be a little bit more of a, of a referee, somebody calling balls and strikes and providing the data, irrespective of whose side it may or may not serve or whose interests may or not be centered by the data. And so data over dogma is about confronting misinformation. It is about putting the data at the front, whether you know it's, it serves my interests, whether it goes directly against my interests. That's going to be front and center. And then it's also an opportunity to try to democratize access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, kind of break down the walls of the ivory tower, because so much of the misinformation that is out there is out there and is in widespread circulation because it is what is freely accessible online. And that's stuff that is in the public domain, which means it's usually stuff that's a century or two old. And so it's wildly outdated stuff. We still got people making arguments based on Fraser's The Golden Bough from the 19th century. Hmm. And so a lot of people don't know where to find up-to-date, accurate scholarship. They don't know where to find the stuff that has been vetted by the academy. And so part of uh, what we're trying to do as well is help expose people to -to up-to-date scholarly perspectives on the Bible and what it is and is not doing and quote unquote saying. And yeah, along the way, we try to have a little bit of fun as well. And we'll find a way, we need to find a way to incorporate more responding to claims that are out there on the podcast. I do a lot of that on TikTok, but I would like to like to find a way to, to get that into the podcast format as well. Dan has this great catchphrase, I guess, on on TikTok, which is, all right, let's see it. <laughs> you know, some other creator has produced something that, you know, claims that the Euphrates River has dried up and now the the, the angel of death is going to come for, forth out of it or whatever. Oh, gosh. And Dan will just say, all right, let's see it and let them make their case on their video and then systematically dismantle them With the gentlest mercilessness (laughs) you've ever seen in your life. (laughs) And, uh, you know, bring all the receipts. And yeah, we we do need to do a little bit more of that because it's a lot of fun to really destroy some of these ding-dong pastors out there (laughs) who think that they've got it all figured out and revelation is happening now and blah, blah, blah. And it's just, it's absurdities. and, And if they, you know, if whatever ding dong Bible college they went to actually taught them anything that scholarship knows, they would know better, but all they were taught is just, you know, whatever's, whatever's happening in, in evangelical nonsense this year. So. Okay. So now I, maybe this is just my personal bias or, or, or the people that I've surrounded myself with, but generally speaking, the people I know who are most into the Bible not a lot of overlap with the people I know who are most into going, huh, turns out I was wrong about this. I'll change my opinion. <laughs> so who is this show for exactly? Who's the intended audience for the podcast? I think the intended audience is, is whoever is interested in the data. And, and yeah, it's going to skew a little bit more toward the skeptical side, just because these are folks who are going to be a little more open to the data. And, and that includes the data that might complicate their assumptions. And there are going to be people on the other side who are going to be interested in it as well. And there are going to be plenty of people in the middle. So it's, I, I think it's for whoever is interested in, in understanding this. And, and that's people who are on all sides of these questions. I get, I get comments all the time from people who, are, who occupy every corner of the spectrum of belief. Absolutely. I mean, we're here talking to you. And so obviously I think you know, as an atheist, I think that this show has great appeal to non-religious people who are nevertheless interested in what is undeniably one of the most, if not the most influential books that we have. Mm-hmm. But I, it, we also have plenty of very devout believers who are nevertheless, inter- who want their belief to be grounded in something more real than just their own interpretation of what they read. Because I'll tell you something, 
one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast was because when I would go and read that book, I had no idea what the fuck was happening most right. of the time. Yeah. It was absolutely baffling to me. And I would constantly, you know, I did stuff. I used to do a show called The How To Heretic, and I would do it large, you know, I would just present large ver swaths of bi uh, Bible stories. You do that. You do the same thing on your show, on this show. And I, when I would do all of this research trying to figure out what I'm even reading, because it's not remotely clear just in and of itself. So having someone who knows the history, the culture of, you know, the ancient Southwest Asian region and knowing, you know, Dan knows, can, can read the uh, original Hebrew and Greek and give us some, some background on that. It's priceless. It is a completely different way of looking at this book than you're going to get in church. And it's so useful. I love it. All right, so so you actually bring me to the to the next question that I that I wanted to ask. When I first started the show, it became obvious that I was going to need to know more about the Bible. We had people, you know, obviously a lot of our listeners are are ex believers and wanted to know our opinion on this or that passage. We do a lot of jokes about it. So so I read the thing. I I got me a Bible. I read it cover to cover, and then I thought, well, that didn't help much. <laughs> so 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 Mac, I'll ask you, like, why is the Bible so damn confusing? There are there are a lot of reasons. Probably the the most conspicuous one is that we're we're talking about a large collection of conflicting and often contradicting texts that come from two to three thousand ish years ago. And so not only are they written in another language, they're written in another time period, they're written in another culture, they're written for reasons that we don't and sometimes can't possibly understand to audiences that are not around anymore, anymore and that we don't really know or understand very well. And so it is in many ways a kind of choose your own adventure. You're going to construct the meaning of the text in ways that are going to make the text interesting or useful for you, for many people. So particularly for people who approach the Bible devotionally as an inspired text, they are going to believe most of the time that this text has something to say to me in my specific circumstances. And for that to happen, they've got to negotiate with the text because a lot of these stories have absolutely no relevance to the 21st century. And so in order to have the text be meaningful to us, we need to negotiate with it. And because text does not have inherent meaning, all reading is negotiating to one degree or another. It's really about trying to construct the meaning in our heads in a way that we think most closely approximates what the authors were trying to achieve with their text. And that's easy for someone you grew up with or for someone who speaks the same language and the same dialect and has the same accent as you and has seen the, the same movies as you. But, you know, if you go to the UK, there are going to be misunderstandings. There are going to be things you have to think about a little harder before you get what they're trying to say. Like I, I tell a story from time to time about my first weekend in Oxford when I stumbled across a KFC and I was like, sweet, and went in <laughs> and asked if they had biscuits. And they were like, why would we have biscuits? And I was like, oh, that's <laughs> right. Biscuit means cookie here. And I was like, okay, so what I'm looking for is uh, it's brown and, <laughs> and, it's and yeah, I was like, it's <laughs> flaky. It's, and I had absolutely no clue how to describe this thing that I had always indexed with this word biscuit. And people are like, oh, you should have said scone. And I was like, eh, I don't think of a scone. That, that's not a scone to me. And so I had to go eat at Burger King. <laughs> and um, which is, luckily uh, is right across the street on Corn Market Street, but it's right next to the Saxon Tower, which is, if you're ever in Oxford, you got to check out the Saxon Tower. But because my experiences with the, with the language were so wildly different from the experiences of this young man behind the counter, and we both spoke the same language natively. And lived at the same time, yeah. And lived at the same time. So now if we're going back to a language that nobody speaks natively. I mean, the modern Hebrew is related, but it is a distinct language. We go back to biblical Hebrew or Koine Greek, the, the Greek used in the New Testament. This is 
wildly, wildly different from the languages as we know them. And so we have to construct a lot more carefully the meaning from that. And scholars are very, very careful about this. They do their best to understand the literary context, the historical context, the rhetorical context. When was this written? What was going on? What were they trying to achieve? And those become like the scaffolding to constructing a more careful understanding of what the author was trying to get at. Many people, though, read the Bible and they just want to know what's in it for me. How is this going to be meaningful or useful to me? Which means it's just going to be their their subconscious, their intuitive cognition constructing that meaning. And then because it's an authoritative text, it is used in the structuring of power and values and in boundary maintenance and things like that, which means that's going to play a role in guiding those intuitions about what it's going to mean. But, you know, the believers are not the only ones who do that. At the same time, you have non-believers or folks who are antagonistic towards believers who are going to approach the Bible because they want to use it as a weapon against another group. Not all of those are going to do that, but... but I don't know what kind of people would do. I've never heard of that that's happening. Never, I mean, that's not, that can't be right. I'm being 100% honest when I think it, it happens less frequently, but it still happens quite a bit. <laughs> it does. And people who, who follow my channel, sometimes they get angry messages from people who are like, I thought you were, you've changed, man. I thought you were this way or that way or the other way. And I was like, I've, I, I used to, to say in uh, intros I do for my channel, at some point, I am going to infuriate all of you because I am not here to be on anybody's team. I am here to try to call balls and strikes. And, and you know, there are a lot of folks who, who uh, think they understand the origins of Easter or of Christmas or what these texts say, Numbers 5 and the, and the Sota. I think that, that's one, Dan, that, that you and I disagree about. We don't. That, here's the thing. We don't disagree about it anymore because <laughs> I actually trust your authority on this. I, I, had to, I had to take the L on that one because I... Uh, <laughs> you, you know, you you have a much richer understanding of it than I do. Well, I will say my favorite moments, both on your TikTok channel and on your podcast, are the moments that challenge my assumptions or, th or what I thought mm -hmm. that I knew. And I, I'm I'm sorry to cut you there, but, but we're going to run out of time here pretty soon. And I wanted to give the the listeners a bit of a taste of what they can expect from the show. So, if you could, I've got a couple of quick questions that I think can sort of steer us towards the debunking that you so often do. So apropos of what you were just saying, in your experience, what is the most common misunderstanding that you find atheists have about the Bible? I think it's it's kind of a trope. It's rhetoric that I see used a lot that always frustrates me. But the idea that it is Bronze Age or, or Iron Age goat herders or whatever, it's their writings. Almost none of it was written in the Bronze Age, if any at all was written in the Bronze Age. A little bit was written in the Iron Age, but the majority of it was written by priests, by the intellectual leaders of Israel and Judah in the middle, uh, middle to the end of the first millennium BCE, at least when we're talking about the Hebrew Bible. And then the New Testament was largely written by educated people later. So, you know, that's not overturning the criticism of the Bible mm -hmm. as outdated and unscientific. But it is a, a misrepresentation that I think causes, it's a foundation for a lot of assumptions about the Bible that I see made by people who are antagonistic toward believers that I, I would like to be able to correct. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I've used exactly that phrasing in the past, but yeah, though, it, it, <laughs> obviously I've, I've, I've meant it in sort of a, a hyperbolic way, but yeah, but I, yeah. I see how that really does kind of color your your understanding of it. And, and, and Uncle Dan, you, I, you know, obviously you've spent a lot of time around atheists and you've learned a lot more about the Bible because of your relationship with Mac here. So it, did, do you have an answer to that question as well? A common misunderstanding that you find atheists making about the Bible? Here's the thing. I will say that it's funny because we, we did another interview on a show with a guy who, who may not be quite as friendly to atheists as you, as you are, <laughs> but he asked a similar question. And the answer that I wish I had given was that I think a lot of atheists actually understand the Bible much better than a lot of the equivalent religious person. Mm -hmm. I think that that's just because atheists tend to be curious in a different way. Mm -hmm. If they if they have any interest in the Bible, they tend to have a different sort of mode of interest. And yet, we all, like like I said, I would read the thing and just you know, do my best in understanding it. And as Dan says, 
it's not like the scholarship, unless you're reading intense scholarship books, which a lot of people do, you know, I've got some reading that I'm I, I on my shelf that I'm I'm planning on digging into. But it's not my it's not my go to reading. It's not what I what I'm most interested in. So all I have is this surface level thing of like, I guess Samson reached into a lion and pulled honey <laughs> out. I don't know if that means something, <laughs> but that's what the book says. So, OK. <laughs> and that's it. Like, that's all I've got. Right. And so having more than that is a boon. I, 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 it's very appreciated. I would, I would quickly add that uh, according to Pew Research, atheists tend to uh, know more about the Bible than most other Christians. And one of the reasons that researchers think that is because a lot of atheists have found their way out of Christianity because they started reading the Bible intently. Yeah. And it was precisely their critical research on the Bible that and the history of Christianity and things like that that lead them out. So atheists tend to have a history of more critical reading of the Bible. So now the obvious flip, uh, flip side of that question, what's the most common biblical misunderstanding that you see from Christians? Oh, the, the most common, the one that, that oh, so many Christians have is the idea that the text is univocal. And, that, and that's a word that, that I have used quite a bit on my channel, which it's a $2 word that means it speaks with one voice. In other words, it has a unified, consistent message, perspective, voice. It can't disagree with itself. And that's the foundation of so much Christian hermeneutics. And that is presupposed in almost any argument I've ever been in with a conservative Christian about the Bible, that one text cannot disagree with another. And that is, is just wildly, wildly incorrect. You can't get three chapters into Genesis without disproving that. But yeah, you're right. That, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. remains <laughs> the, the, the general th thought. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, without even getting into inspiration or inerrancy, I would just go straight to univocality. Because I, I, and once you break that down, I think the Bible becomes so much more interesting, but it undermines so many dogmas. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it is a far more interesting book from this perspective than it ever was from a devotional perspective. It is, it, it's, it's richer. It's more like, you know, I'm not going to go as far as a lot of people and say it's grand literature, but it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. But only when you're willing to encounter it as in this way of, of saying like, it's not, I'm going to encounter this not as uh, every inch of it has to mean something inspired by deity, but rather this is exposing ancient culture. This is exposing ancient thought and belief systems. It's exposing, you know, beefs between different cultures. And, and it's, I, and when you get it to that place, it becomes really, really interesting. And hopefully that's what our show is about. Yeah, that's where I find your show as a absolutely at its best when we're, when we're looking at, you know, competing philosophies that are obviously existing side by side in the Bible, whether those be competing, you know, within various factions within the religion or or competing as in like, you know, from from different eras where like one scribe is like, well, obviously they didn't mean that. I mean, there's just the <laughs> here whatever. Really interesting stuff. I and and I if it hasn't come across yet in the interview, let me just state explicitly to the listener that I highly recommend this show. I listened to a couple episodes in preparation for the interview, then I listened to like three more because I couldn't stop doing it. And now I'm and, and of course I'm going to be finishing the backlog in the next couple of days. I just have one last question while we still have you here, Mac. I believe you are the first Christian that we've ever had on our podcast in oh, wow. what's five hundred and forty episodes. <laughs> Can I now tell people that some of my best friends are Christian? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just step in here, Mac, and just point out, I've known Lo Noah for a long time. He doesn't have that many friends. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. No, you're a high percentage-wise. So, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I start from the baseline of treating everybody as a friend. So absolutely. Until you give me a reason to think otherwise. Uh, so what, and so I, I, I wanted to add this one thing and this probably won't make it to the air. Maybe I'll just leave this for the patrons, but I, there was a, a bit on your show where I was actually kind of offended and I wanted to mention this while I had you here, Mac, you mentioned, I believe it was on your ninth episode, the episode of police squad mm -hmm. where Frank goes undercover as the key store owner to, to bust the, um, right. 
And you failed to mention what might have been the funniest line in all of 80s television history where he, he breaks into the bad guy's office uh-huh. uh, and the guy goes, he, the bad guy comes in and he goes, who are you and how did you get in here? And he goes, I'm the locksmith. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm the, the locksmith. locksmith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And the, and the best part was was Leslie Nielsen's deadpan. Delivery. Oh yeah, God, he was so good at that. Um, I, I, no, I just I heard that reference, and I'm like, you know, if me and this guy were ever kidnapped together and trying to like hash out a plan without the kidnappers knowing what we were talking about, I feel like we could make this shit happen. <laughs> it's all '80s references all the time. Yeah, well, right. Yeah, and and that's where the context is so important to communicating. You can't you can't get that. I think about somebody two thousand years from now trying to understand my brother and me when we talk, because it is all quotes from Blazing Saddles, from Three Amigos, from <laughs> from Young Frankenstein, Spaceballs. Well, this is a good selection. Yeah. So that's what built my lexicon growing up. And if you don't know those movies, you you just have no chance. Yeah. No, that's a way to make this relevant. Now, well, now, now it might make it into the regular feed. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was something I did real quick, if you don't mind. When I was in, uh, I was in Greece, doing a, a presentation to a bunch of uh, LDS missionaries and they all spoke English. And I was making a point about something. And I said, if, uh, you know, if somebody says no more rhyming, rhyming now, I mean it. What do you say in response? And they all just stared at me blankly. And I was like, <laughs> you're all Europeans. None of you are from America. <laughs> and, uh, and there was one kid in the back who slowly raised his hand and he was like, anybody want a peanut? And I was like, yes, <laughs> thank you. And it was because he, he was from Scotland, but he had done a, a semester at a college in the U.S. And so he had seen this movie, The Princess Bride. And so that kind of, that kind of communication is, is uh, it's thick context. You have to have the background knowledge in order to be able to communicate on the level that, that people communicate on. So not unlike lion honey. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. That's, that, that, that's a great point, man. That's a great point. Well, look, best of luck to you guys with the new show. I'm absolutely devouring it. I'm sure our listeners are going to love it too. If you're listening along, you want to you want to check out the show again. It's Data Over Dogma. You're going to find it wherever you get your podcasts or just check the show notes for this episode for a handy dandy link. Dan, Mac, thank you again so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having us.